And the conscience issues is an interesting one. Um, you know, I'd like to get your take on this. It's amazing how many 16th, 17th century writers wrote on conscience. Yeah. You know, Perkins, like cases of conscience. Right. And these guys were constantly wrestling through this. And conscience is a big deal. We think of the Luther statement, right? It's wrong to go against conscience. But conscience is not sovereign. No. <laughs> and, and conscience can be wrong. Um, <laughs> so I, I we, we're also in this environment now that if I play the conscience card, like I'm good. Yeah. My favorite I'm good to not stand for anything. You know? My favorite is I have peace about it. Yeah. I've, I've thought about this decision. I have peace about it. You know, as peace about their decisions, sociopaths, they don't wrestle. Mm -hmm. They're, they're not, they're not in, uh, they're not distraught right. in their decisions. They have peace all day long. So yeah. to me, that's a very poor uh, judge of whether or not you're doing the right thing that you have peace about it. <laughs> My conscience is clear. Yeah. The sociopath's conscience is clear too. Yeah. I, I think we need to reevaluate. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's exactly right. I mean, Paul, Paul talks about things to which we're now ashamed as Christians, Romans six, that we, we go back and, you know, even in Romans one, when he's, when he's talking about the sins that are listed there, he talks about those who approve of those who do them and, and celebrate. And, and, and I guess, you know, at what point do we say, listen, um, on an issue like this, that we might say is not so some people might say it's not so cut and dry and clear in the scripture. What is clear is our is our stance against that which is profane, that which is unholy. Um, Jude talks about hating even the garment stained by the flesh. I mean, that's really strong language, yeah. right? And that that principle there is is separation. So it's First Corinthians five. You know, it's it's Revelation eighteen. Come out and be separate. Like right. there is a point at which I think, and especially in our modern culture, Christian culture, we've lost this principle of separation yeah. because we're so afraid of hurting witness. We're so afraid of losing people. Um, we've almost been bullied into this on, this on this score. But there is a very strong biblical principle of separation. J Jesus called, uh, and you think about all the calls in the Old, old Covenant of Israel to come out and be separate from the nations. Yeah. It's almost like we only have two options. It's either, you know, 1950s fundamentalism where you practice third degree separation. You don't hang out with people. You don't do bad things yourself. You don't hang out with people who do bad things. Then third degree, you don't hang out with people who hang out with people who do bad <laughs> things. And you can't just do that yeah. ad infinitum. So there's one extreme, you know, you basically become Amish at that point and yeah. completely detach yourself from all culture. Or the other extreme where we seem to be more so in our culture today where you can't really separate from anything and if you do then now you're just mean yeah and well we you know we want to be winsome uh, people won't like us if we take a stand yeah. on this issue and yeah of course there are two extremes you want to avoid and and you can take a stand on every issue and th everything is a hill to die on we don't want to be there either but we also don't want to be so um passive and going along with everything that we have no conviction whatsoever. Right. And, right. and people don't regard us as different right. in any way. There it is. If we're yeah. not different, then what do we have, to put it crassly, to sell them? Yeah. We have nothing to offer them if we're just giving them a kinder, gentler version of what they can get in the culture. And that that goes for everything. Goes for our worship, goes for our theology, goes for our Christian life, the way we live. If we're trying to blend in with the world, we have nothing attractive to offer them. The way that Begg approached this in his sermon, you know, this last Sunday was take the parable of the prodigal son and preach, you know, the father's compassion to the son and his sin. And the insinuation was that much of the, the backlash, much of the response he received was akin to the response of the older son in the house. Um, so the assumption behind it is, is that if for the sake of winning back this son, which you do wonder, you know, is there any kind of personal situation in this in someone's life when they when they cross these boundaries that they know are going to stir up the pot like this? You know, because oftentimes we could have, and this is what's hard, right? I'm not saying this is the case in, in big situation. I don't know. But if we if we have a son or a daughter who's doing these things, I had a wise elder tell me years ago, Chris, 
many parents will be objective with the truth until it comes to their children. That's right. Right. And that's, that's many hard. high profile guys have changed their theology. Right. When one of their children gets involved in some sin and yeah. now all of a sudden, oh, let me rethink this. Right. Right. And, and, you know, open theism, uh, you think of Wolterstorff, the whole thing really was, was propagated by a very sad circumstance in his life. Right. You know? And so these things are real. Um, these things hit home and, um, you know, we're called to, I mean, there's a reason Jesus said, unless you hate your father, hate your mother, brother, you can't be my disciple. The point was, listen, he, he's before all, <laughs> you know, he's before, before even our, our family, but. And that, we have to do the hard thing. Yeah. I have a pastor friend who was on a consistory and they had to discipline his own daughter. Yeah. Yeah. He had to do the hard thing. It was the right decision. He made the right decision. He didn't change his theology to envelop his daughter into the kingdom. Right. Right. So the assumption behind it, Lisa's big was, is listen, you know, I'm trying to be compassionate here. I'm trying to give an olive branch here. I'm trying to reach out so that this wayward, you're trying to reach out, Grandma, so that your wayward son or daughter would come home. I remember when uh, Rosaria came and I did an interview with her um, for an AGR conference, and she said something that was stunning. In the, I, I'll never forget it. In the middle of that interview, she said, you know, I don't know that if I had, you know, when I came, you know, I, I was practicing, I was a practicing lesbian. When I came out of all that, I don't know if I would be able to come out today and, and repent of my sin in our modern environment. And she said something very similar to that. I don't, I'm not getting the exact word. The point she was making was because there's so much affirming. Yes. What she actually needed was somebody to lovingly, we always, we always say that, of course, of course. lovingly, kindly, Tell her that she's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like that's what she needed. Christopher Yuan said the same thing. That's his whole story, right? I just had him in here. And and so, you know, these are people who've actually lived it. Of right? course. Yes. And have have amazing testimonies and say, listen, that's what we needed. You're not helping by doing the other, the opposite right. of so, affirming them in their sin. So that premise needs to be challenged. Right. And we're not helping the sinner if we enter into his sin with him. The father of the prodigal son does not go to him in his riotous living and support him in his riotous living. To me, the equivalent would be attending his gay wedding. Yeah, imagine that scenario. Oh, so he hears his son is getting married to another man off in, in Vegas, in the pigsty, right? Oh, well, to win him, to yeah. win him, I better head over to Vegas. I got to go chase him down. That's just a, that, and pat him on the head in the midst of his riotous living. Yeah, no. And I saw the also the oh well, Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, not while they were sinning, right. not while they were actively sinning. <laughs> he didn't go to the brothel. Yeah, that's, that's and hang the, out with the prostitutes. That's exactly right. They came to him. He brought them out mm -hmm. of it. He didn't enter into their sin with them. Right. He preached the truth and brought them out. This is our example to follow. Yeah. And, you know, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. That message is not softened at any point in time, no. like you're saying. Like, it's not like, oh, in this situation, well, I can't say it so strongly. Listen, we can say things strongly and still care and love for yes. somebody. They're, they're not mutually exclusive Again, things. Again, it's these extremes. Yeah. You're either affirming the person in a sin or you're just taking a sledgehammer over the head. No, these, these straw men are ridiculous. Yes, you preach the truth in a loving way. You don't have to be a jerk about it. Now, have many people been jerks about it in the past? Are they still today? Yeah. Of course. But that is not absolutely necessary. You can preach the truth in love and not let your own obnoxious personality get in the way. Yeah. And, you know, Jesus, if you look at his whole ministry, I think of the fight in John 7. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating, it just came to mind. But in John 7, uh, his brothers want him you know, to go out and make himself great. <laughs> it's, a, it's really interesting. And um, Jesus says this, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek, you know, to kill me? He's confronting them about sin. He's telling him, you, you, you Pharisees, none of you 
have kept the law, if I were coming, if I were coming from to seek my own glory, I'd be telling you sweet things. Right. I, I'd be telling you kind things. I'd be telling you things that don't have to do with repentance. But he says, but he who seeks uh, the glory of the one who sent me is true and no unrighteousness is in him. I have to tell the truth. And yeah. that's why he was crucified because of the truth. Right. He never once soft peddled it. No. And especially to those who were in positions of authority, right? the religious authority, he gave them the truth. Was that a bad career move on his part? Absolutely. It yeah. cost him his life. Yeah, it cost him his life. If he yeah. wanted to soft pedal it, he could have and had plenty of uh, worldly adulation, yeah. but he would not have been the Messiah. Yeah. The people pulling the conscience card, I, I, there are real conscience issues in life. Sure. There are. There are, and, and you're, are, it's ca- taken captive by the word of God, right? Um, you know, I, do I think do I think Alistair's sincere in this case? Yes, I think he's he's absolutely sincere. I think what we've talked about something has affected him on this score. But you can be sincerely wrong. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, it's just sad because you know, on the other side of things, you know, aside from all of that, there are we we do live in an environment full of Pharisees. I mean, we're all recovering Pharisees. You know, how do we deal? How do we deal with people in these sins? And I think we still have to continue to reiterate listen, um, we don't behave like the Pharisee. Right. Jesus didn't behave like a Pharisee right. in addressing these things. He told the truth. He told the truth with the aim of helping them out of it. But you'll never be helped out of it. It's, you know, it's the old line you know, um, the cure is only as radical as the, the disease. Yeah. Right. They have to know what's wrong. Right. And any sort of uh, supporting or affirming doesn't aid in that great goal. And many people, their testimonies of coming to faith initially or being restored to the faith after wandering, the inciting incident oftentimes is some sort of calamity. Mm -hmm. So I, in our uh, second service, we take prayer requests before the service and we pray about various requests and we always pray for the unbelieving children of uh, certain members of our congregation, those who are wayward and so forth. And I will often pray, bring calamity in their lives to shake them up. It's a tough prayer. Yes. Help them to see their own mortality. Yeah. And one of these calamitous incidents could be confronting people like this in their sins with the truth right in a very clear stone cold way again with love not being a jerk about it but confronting them because maybe they've never heard this before and so we can't soft pedal this thing so that they're comfortable in their sin when we're in the depths of sin we need our cages rattled We need God to shake us and wake us up by the power of the Holy Spirit to see our sin for what it is, to see him for who he really is. And so I I fear that some of this um, overly loving approach that affirms people in their sin does not give the proper um, jolt Mm -hmm. that these sinners need in order to come to the realization of the truth. Mm Mm-hmm. Coming back sort of full circle to this thing, um, getting back to ecclesiology, this is where the church should be incredibly helpful, <laughs> right? Should be. Um, you know, this is this is why we have this is why we have discipline, right? Third mark of a true and faithful church it is to go after wandering wandering sheep who've fallen into these sins. Paul does make a categorical distinction in First Corinthians five. You know, anyone. And this is another issue we haven't talked about with the marriage thing. Anyone who claims to be a brother, anyone who claims to be a Christian, you know, um, and is living in sin, we have nothing to do with, right. <laughs> right? Like, now that doesn't mean nothing to do with in the sense of we're not kind to them. We don't, it's that the fellowship is not there. Right. It's the koinonia has been broken. And we don't necessarily cut off all contact yeah, like we we're Scientologists. Contact, right. We preach the gospel to them. Right, right. We remind them of right. their baptism. right. Right. We give them the truth in Christ. We don't shun them. We like don't shun Anabaptists. them. That's so important. I've said that in the catechism I wrote. We don't shun them. Um, but he does make a difference between those who um, who are in the world, who we'd have to separate from the world, right? 
But even that separation doesn't mean it throws down our who we are and our identity in, in Christ and our convictions and basic morality to support them in that sin. Yeah. So, yeah. You know. But ecclesiology, I mean, this is where in this particular case, you know, when you have these complex situations, if you have a grandma who's really struggling with how to handle this, she should be able to come to her pastor and the pastor should give her the advice that represents the whole right. elder body. And right? not just the pastor's personal opinion. Not just opinion, because this is, this is what happened in this case. He even said, yeah, I've got my pastoral staff who disagrees. And I'm like, what about your elders? Right. You know, okay, you got pastor over here believing this, pastor over here believing this, pastor over here, and you believing this. There's no un unanimity on this important issue. <laughs> right? It might be confusing in that church. It might be confusing in that church. Well, and, and when he preached the sermon, there was a lot of clapping. Yeah. I wonder, did he just divide the church? Like, was there half sitting there saying, I don't agree with this, and half sitting there saying, yay, you've made a mess of things now. And the one step up from that is if those people who don't agree, can they appeal? Right. To whom can they appeal? That's a good question. If they say our pastor seems to be teaching error, mm -hmm. where do they go? Right. They can't go to him. Do the elders, will, will they hold him accountable? Right. Will they investigate the matter and see if it's error? This is where that extra level of ecclesiology is so crucial that we have systems in place in Reformed ecclesiology to investigate these matters and to adjudicate them. Right. Right. Very important. And especially in, in this case, it's not <clears throat> nearly as consequential, maybe, as like a discipline case if someone right. in the church is being disciplined or something like that. To whom can they appeal? If in a congregational situation, if you are unjustly disciplined, what are you going to do? Right. You have to leave the church and just go down the street and unite somewhere else. Whereas in Presbyterial ecclesiology, we have means of appeal that can correct uh, erroneous decisions right. by church bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's comforting. Yeah. I tell this to all of our uh, new members, people invest, people who are uh, new to the church, visiting the church. This should be comforting to you that we have these means of appeal. Because if I go wrong, if our consistory goes wrong, you can appeal that. You can appeal it to the consistory first. You can appeal it to our classes. You can appeal it to our synod. And we often have cases that get rectified by these other assemblies. And see, this is this is who should be protecting Alistair Begg. Right. Um, I think that's that's the note to end on here is that, listen, I understand there are crucial doctrines of the Christian faith, justification by faith alone. He didn't deny any of those core doctrines. He he, I think, erred on an application yeah. of how to handle oneself in a particularly difficult scenario. And just, sorry to interrupt, but how sad is it that this issue gets all the attention? I know. When something like justification I know. doesn't? No, I know. I, <laughs> when the gospel's at stake, I don't care about that argument, but this one, oh, yeah. let's all jump on it. And let's crucify him. Yeah. Let's crucify him. What we're appealing to here is, yeah, we don't agree with his position, but he should have elders protecting him. Yeah. And, and that's why, in this case, their intervention in this on an application could have saved a big mess. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see what that does to that congregation. Be, yeah. It would be very sad. I know sad. he's not speaking at the Shepherds Conference now. So, yeah. Um, see, it's already having major fallout that could have been ecclesiastically handled in a way that protected him and immediately gave the enemies of the Lord less ammunition. Yeah. You know? And instead of just blasting him on the internet, well, right. bring him up on charges. Yeah. In, in, in our uh, ecclesiology, we could bring him up on charges. We could adjudicate this in church courts. But in his ecclesiology, all you can do is write a mean tweet yeah. at him yeah. <laughs> and hope that convinces him yeah. to change his mind. It does say on his website, the elders, one of their responsibilities is to refute error. Hmm. So that... They did state that you know, they yeah. should do that um, if that's the case. But, you know, I just think it also reflects, it's just sad that, you know, everything's so outside of the ministry now of the local church in our environment. It's really hard now to know 
how to handle and have any accountability at these, in these things. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just more challenging. So, but we should pray, pray for Alistair and the situation and that, um, pray for the grandma. Yeah. And, and, um, in any of these future scenarios that we would be wise in how we handle ourselves. I just, I, it gets old when all I do is, you know, open up social media and maybe I should be like Dan Borvin, just not do that. Don't feed the trolls. Don't feed the trolls. But you see just the, the, the blatant attacks and you, you just, it gets wearisome. You know, it's like I, the Lord will still have his church. The Lord's wisdom will prevail, but it's, it's, it's discouraging. Yeah. That's why, you know, tw- Twitter is for old baseball clips. <laughs> that's what I want. I had a, there was a great one yesterday. Will Clark, he, he he took on the entire infield of the St. Louis Cardinals, like 1985. That's what Twitter is for. That's what Twitter is for. It's not for yeah. settling ecclesiastical disputes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Judge and jury in the court of public opinion. There you go. That's yeah. that's classy. Yeah, yeah. But that's what we do. Anyways, thanks, Dan, for the insights. Yeah. 